Let's study 10th standard ICSC chemistry chapter 7C nitric acid. Nitric acid was initially called aqua fortis. Blah 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 blah. Lab preparation of nitric acid. Don't try this at home. We have this round flask called the retort with a neck, long neck. We have nitrate or chile salt petri, which is potassium nitrate and sodium nitrate respectively. Reacted with conch sulfuric acid. So the reaction taking place here is that a less volatile acid is displacing a more volatile one. Make sure you write vapors here or put an up arrow because nitric acid is in the form of a gas which is condensed with the help of this cold water to make nitric acid. Remember this water is not mixing with the nitric acid, it's external. Make sure that the temperature is less than 200 degrees Celsius because why do you want it to be more than 200 degrees Celsius when the work can be done with at less than 200 degrees Celsius? And also at less than 200 degrees Celsius, bisulfates are formed, which are acid salts because they have hydrogen in them, which is ionizable. Now these acid salts don't stick to the glass vessels, whereas if you keep it greater than 200 degrees Celsius, then sulfates will be formed, which will stick to the glass vessels. And it's difficult to remove that crust. Now the ratio of the two reactants is 1 ratio 1. Some precautions have to be taken. The complete apparatus should be made up of glass because nitric acid vapors like the acid, just like the acid, they are very corrosive. So rubber, wood should not be used. Conch HCl should not be used because sulfuric acid is less volatile or non-volatile. Whereas hydrochloric acid is pretty volatile so even that acid can evaporate and it will mix with nitric acid and in the right ratio it will become aqua regia which is a powerful reagent and of course the temperature should be properly maintained but how will you identify that these are nitric acid vapors well you use the same test which you do for nitric acid or for any nitrate that is if you add some copper to it and you heat it you will see some reddish brown fumes which are of nitrogen dioxide, but how do you know they are nitrogen dioxide just because it's reddish brown? No, because even bromine vapors are reddish brown. So there is a test for this also. It turns acidified ferrous sulfate solution brown. A similar reaction will be studied in the brown ring test very shortly. These are the reactions which need to be studied. Interestingly here, conch sulfuric acid is mentioned, but not here. Here sodium bisulfate which is created from the above reaction will be further reacted at greater than 200 degrees Celsius. So first this is formed and then the sodium sulfate is formed. This is in case of nitric acid reaction. The reactions for hydrochloric acid were quite different if you compare. One more reason why the temperature should be kept less than 200 degrees Celsius is to prevent the damage to the glass apparatus, especially if you've bought a cheap quality one. And another reason is the nitric acid produced at a high temperature decomposes to give nitrogen dioxide gas. We don't want that to happen. Students, so pure nitric acid is colorless, but the ones in your school lab or any lab in a bottle is yellowish. It has a yellowish tinge because with time the nitric acid decomposes to give nitrogen dioxide, which is a reddish brown gas. And that, that may dissolve in water to give it a yellowish tinge. Yes, when it dissolves in water, it can once again react with the oxygen in the air to give you back the nitric acid. It's a reversible reaction. So at any point of time, the solution is a mixture of both nitrogen dioxide dissolved in water as well as of nitric acid. So there is a yellowish tinge in the glass bottle, unlike pure nitric acid, which is colorless. So how do I get rid of the yellowish tinge? Well, using pepsidant, etc. won't help. The best way to get rid of the yellowish tinge is by bubbling of air that is, uh, or carbon dioxide through it, because the air will drive out the reddish brown nitrogen dioxide out of the warm acid, or it can even oxidize the nitrogen dioxide back into nitric acid. And whenever nitrogen dioxide content decreases in the acid, the yellowish tinge also decreases. 
do not bubble air or carbon dioxide in your teeth. It may not work. Another option is dilution with water. If you add a lot of water, then a lot of nitrogen dioxide will get completely dissolved and get oxidized to give you the nitric acid. Next, we have the manufacture of nitric acid by a process called Oswald process or Oswald process. It has three steps. Step number one, in the catalytic chamber, there is a catalytic oxidation of ammonia to nitric oxide. We have studied this reaction in the ammonia chapter. Look at the conditions. And also the ratio of ammonia to air is 1 ratio 10. So a lot of air is used here. It's an exothermic reaction, by the way. So if you remember, even though the reaction stops, the platinum continues to glow for some time. We also know that the NO doesn't stay this way for a long time because as soon as it is exposed to oxygen, it will form right, nitrogen dioxide, which is a reddish brown gas. The conversion rate here is 95%, but 5% of the uh, nit uh, ammonia is burnt to form nitrogen and steam. <clears throat> that was the other reaction in ammonia, if you remember, which gave us a green flame, greenish yellow flame, yellowish green flame, or whatever. Oxidation chamber. Um, well, no need to heat here. The temperature was already high. So the nitrogen monoxide will react with oxygen at 50 degrees Celsius, which will automatically be created in this chamber because of the hot gases and nitrogen dioxide is formed. And finally, in the absorption tower, this nitrogen dioxide will dissolve in water and get oxidized to form nitric acid. But note that it's a reversible reaction. So we put the reverse arrow as well. Now, why do we have excess of air? Why is the ratio 1 ratio 10? Well, that's because only the oxygen part of the air is used in the reaction. And oxygen is only 21% of the air. So... Even though if we give them 10 units of air, effectively we are giving it only 2 units of oxygen. And air is required in each step. Here oxygen is required, here oxygen is required, and even here oxygen is required. So that is why we need to use a lot of air in this reaction. Why is the electrical heating done only initially? Then we can switch it off. Because it's an exothermic reaction. So once the reaction starts, the heat of the first reaction will help the, sec the next batch of reactions to take place and so on and so forth. Color. A pure 98% concentrated nitric acid is uh, colorless. But the commercial acid is uh, yellowish brown. Odor. It's suffocating. It has a sour taste but don't try to taste it. Solubility. Highly soluble in water. Constant boiling mixture. It forms a constant boiling mixture at 121 degrees Celsius containing 68% of the acid. Constant boiling mixture means that if I try to concentrate it further, more than 68%, by trying to boil the mixture, thinking that the water will evaporate and the concentration of nitric acid in it will increase. Well, after this constant boiling point, what would happen is that even the nitric acid will vaporize along with the water in the same ratio as it was present in the solution. So effectively, we can't concentrate it further than 68% at 121 degrees Celsius just by boiling it. Yeah, we can do it by other methods like distillation under reduced pressure in the presence of conch sulfuric acid. So under special circumstances, we can concentrate it further and bring it to 98% purity. And at that time, we will call it fuming nitric acid because it's very, very angry at being heated so much. Also, if nitric acid falls on the skin accidentally, then it will combine with the protein of the skin, forming a yellow compound called xanthoproteic acid, which stains the skin yellow. Now let's talk about the stability of nitric acid. It's not that stable compared to the other acids. I just explained how even at room temperature, it decomposes, and in fact, at higher temperature, it decomposes a lot to give nitrogen dioxide, which gives it a yellowish brown or a yellow or a brownish yellow tinge to, the, to its color. Like any other acid, it changes the color of the indicators. Dilute nitric acid ionizes in water to give hydronium ions and nitrate ions, and it is because of the hydronium ions that it has the acidic properties. 
one molecule of nitric acid on ionization in water gives you one hydronium ion. So it is called a monobasic acid. It ionizes almost completely. Because of the high concentration of hydrogen ions or hydronium ions, it has acidic nature. Dilute nitric acid is more acidic than conch nitric acid. Because dilute nitric acid has a higher concentration of hydrogen ions. It ionizes more compared to concentrated nitric acid, which has very less water to ionize the nitric acid property. So conch nitric acid is a powerful oxidizing agent and less of an acid. But dilute nitric acid, even though even this is a, an oxidizing agent, but it does show some acidic properties as well. For example, if you react it with a, an alkali, then neutralization takes place. With carbonates and bicarbonates, carbon dioxide is released. With sulfites and bisulfites, SO2 is released. And with sulfides, H2S will be released. But there is one reaction which is missing from the typical properties of an acid shown here. Can you guess which one? The reaction of active metals. If you remember, active metals react with typical acids or dilute acids to give hydrogen gas. Displacement reaction takes place. But not here. Here, hydrogen cannot be formed because of the oxidizing nature of nitric acid. You see, whenever any metal reacts with nitric acid, especially hot and conch nitric acid, salt and water are produced, plus nitrogen dioxide gas is released. That's because nitric acid releases something called nascent oxygen. Nascent means single oxygen, and you know single oxygen is very reactive. And that is why even metals like copper, which are below hydrogen in the activity series, even they can be reacted with conch nitric acid or even dilute nitric acid. Copper does not react with dilute sulfuric acid or with dilute HCl because it's below hydrogen. But with nitric acid, it can react simply because of the oxidizing nature of nitric acid, both dilute and conch. So depending on whether you're using dilute or conch, the product formed may be either NO2 or NO. Look here. If you're using dilute, then we get NO. And if you're using hot dilute or conch, then we get NO2. No hydrogen has been released. The hydrogen which was supposed to be released is oxidized by this oxidizing agent to give you water. If you want hydrogen, then use either of the two metals, magnesium or manganese. Only these two metals will react with very dilute and cold nitric acid with just 1% concentration. And then you will get hydrogen. Because in these conditions, the oxidizing property of nitric acid is greatly reduced. So we get a typical reaction of salt and hydrogen gas, a displacement reaction. What about reaction of nitric acid with non-metals? Well, conch and hot nitric acid is such a powerful oxidizing agent. It will oxidize even non-metals to form the respective acids. That is phosphoric acid, sulfuric acid, and carbonic acid. But in any reaction, we avoid writing carbonic acid because it's very unstable. So instead, we just write CO2 plus water. And of course, NO2 is released in all these cases. So it's interesting how nitric acid is being used to make sulfuric acid that is volatile acid into non-volatile acid. Now let's talk about passivity. Passivity or inertness of a metal like iron or aluminium is the property in which the metals which were supposed to be reactive are unreactive under the conditions. When iron and aluminium are put in nitric acid, we expect some reaction to take place. But because of the formation of a thin oxide coating on the surface of these metals, the further reaction is prevented because this coating prevents the nitric acid from coming in contact with the iron and aluminium. Yes, if the oxide layer is removed mechanically or chemically, like by pickling of the metal or something, or by just rubbing it, then the metal will become active again and will react to a certain extent. Next, aqua regia. We've already studied this in hydrochloric acid chapter. When you take a concentration, concentrated nitric acid and concentrated HCl in the ratio 1, ratio 3, nascent chlorine is released, which is very reactive. It can attack even noble metals to give you soluble salt. So the gold and platinum can dissolve in nitric acid, conch nitric acid and conch HCl combination called aqua regia.
Now let's study the tests for nitric acid. Test number one is uh, take the conch nitric acid or any nitrate, for example, potassium nitrate. When you heat it, it gives you a reddish brown gas which turns green acidified ferrous sulfate brown which proves that the gas was NO2 and which proves that the acid was nitric acid or it had nitrate in the salt. Another test is add copper and um, if it's a nitrate then add conch sulfuric acid as well and now heat it. Again we'll see NO2 gas being released which gives uh, which is a reddish brown gas which turns green acidified ferrous sulfate brown again proving that the substance had nitrate radical. Also, a blue solution is formed because copper nitrate is blue. So these two tests were for conch nitric acid. But what, what about dilute nitric acid? Is there a test for that? Yes, it's called the brown ring test. And all these three tests can be used for any nitrate, potassium nitrate, I'm sorry, not potassium nitrate, other nitrates like copper nitrate, zinc nitrate, iron nitrate, magnesium nitrate, etc. Remember, these tests are not useful for potassium, sodium and ammonium nitrates. Only this one will work. So a quick recap. There are three tests for the nitrate radical. The first two can be used for conch nitric acid and the third one, the brown ring test, can be used for dilute nitric acid. Now, apart from the nitric acid, let's talk about nitrates. All three tests can be used for nitrates, but the first test of just heating, thermal decomposition, cannot be used for potassium, sodium and ammonium nitrates because these nitrates are quite stable to heat. But they can be tested by the second and the third method. Now, let's understand the brown ring test. Take a solution of the nitrate or dilute nitric acid in a test tube and to that nitrate or nitric acid, which is actually an oxidizing agent, add acidified ferrous sulfate solution. Make sure you write conch here. Acidified ferrous sulfate. And it should be freshly prepared because if it is exposed to air for a long time, it becomes ferric sulfate, which won't work. We need ferrous sulfate. Now, when you add it, some reaction will take place and NO is produced. And nitric oxide further reacts with this ferrous sulfate to give nitroso iron 2 sulfate which is a brown colored compound and give, that gives us a brown ring. Now keep the test tube still, do not move it. Then you'll see the brown ring because it is lighter than conch sulfuric acid so it will float above it but it is heavier than ferrous sulfate solution so it will be below it. It will be at the boundary of these two. If you shake this test tube, then you will lose the brown ring because then the conch sulfuric acid will come in contact with the iron sulfate and the water out here will further react with sulfuric acid and it's an exothermic reaction and the heat will decompose this brown ring. Now uses of nitric acid, it's used for TNT, which is used for dynamites. It is used to make some nitrates. This is used in gunpowder, this is used in fertilizers, in fact it's explosive as well. Silver nitrate in photography, but nowadays we don't use this for photography, we have digital cameras. That will be included in the syllabus perhaps once the digital cap cameras become obsolete and new technology comes. Now let's look at some reaction about preparation of nitrates. We know that when nitric acid reacts with an alkali, salt and water is produced, that's neutralization reaction. We also know that whenever a, a metal reacts with nitric acid, salt, water and nitrogen dioxide is produced if it's conch nitric acid. And again, if it's reacting with a base, neutralization takes place, we get salt and water. So the observation here is that the black substance changes into a blue solution. Now different nitrates behave differently on thermal decomposition. As I said, sodium and potassium nitrates they are very stable, so they don't decompose. So they will just form the nitrite plus oxygen gases released. Whereas ammonium nitrate is it's not that stable, but when heated, it will give you nitrous oxide, that is dinitrogen oxide or laughing gas. It's a neutral gas, by the way, and also steam. That is why in this test, 
potassium and sodium and ammonium nitrate could not be detected because the NO2 is released in all other nitrates but not in these three nitrates. All other nitrates on heating will give us NO2 gas as you can see here. Lead nitrate gives us, copper nitrate gives, it, gives us even silver nitrate and mercury nitrate will give us nitrogen dioxide gas. And the test for that is it turns acidified ferrous sulfate, green acidified ferrous sulfate brown, just like the brown ring did, just like the brown ring was formed. Observations are very important here. When lead nitrate, oh, this is my favorite reaction, when it is re heated, then I get a buff yellow residue, when, which is buff yellow when hot and yellow when cold. Nitrogen dioxide reaction, I've already told you. Oxygen is also released. You can write the test for that. It rekindles the glowing splinter and there is a decrepitation sound. There is a cracking sound or crackling sound. When copper nitrate, a blue salt is heated, you get a black residue, copper oxide, and the remaining two observations are the same. When silver and mercury nitrate salts are heated, well, they are so unstable that you don't get the oxide, rather you get the pure metal itself and the oxygen is released. So a silvery residue is left behind. So that's why silver and mercury can easily be obtained from their ores just by thermal decomposition. Hi students, this is AJ sir. If you like this video, press the like button. If you would like to enroll for my online test series or online lectures, email me or message me on Instagram. Check the description for more information.